first of all, I'd like to thank the fellows and whoever's responsible for, it for inviting me here, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And I had a wonderful time teaching at Long Beach State. It was a terrific career. Um, I taught a lot of courses that I absolutely loved, and in addition to which, I got a wife out of it. So it was a great, <laughs> it was an absolutely terrific arrangement. But there were a number of courses that I taught that, on reconsideration, I don't think I did quite as good a job as I could have. And one of them was a course that, to which Laura sort of referred indirectly when she said that we teach a lot of courses for other people in other colleges. And one of those courses is Math 103. And I'm going to, hopefully this thing is still alive. And I can click up the Math 183. No, wow. This is going to. 103, rather. This is going to be yet another disaster. Well, anyway, let me tell you what Math 103 is. Math 103 is what's normally thought of as liberal arts mathematics or mathematical ideas. Um, I could have, if somebody is good with, uh, I'm only going to really need this a little later, but uh, I will need it. Anyway, Math 103 covers a lot of very basic ideas in mathematics, such as um, combinatorics, counting, number systems mathematical logic, a whole bunch of things, and virtually all the students who take that course are liberal arts majors, and they'd rather be elsewhere. <laughs> and, um, and so when I, teach, when I taught the course, I tried a lot of different approaches, and the students were generally lukewarm about it. And at the same time while I was teaching, um, at the same time while I was teaching Math 103, I was also giving talks to the elementary school students that come to class here. Um, we have a day, or at least we used to have, and I'm sure we still have, where we invite the elementary students here. And what I would do is I would do demonstrations for the elementary school students to wild enthusiasm. While my Math 103 students, at, you know, just, they just wanted to get out of here. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, when I talked to, I had a number of teachers come back and see my demonstration uh, for elementary schools many years in a row. And finally, one of them came up to me and said, you know, Jim, you're the second most popular course with our students. Um, the first most popular being the boa constrictor in the biology department. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I figured I was doing pretty well if I was second only to a boa constrictor, especially considering that I can't eat live animals. <laughs> but what I thought was, I thought uh, that maybe what I should be doing in Math 103 is I should be doing the same type of demonstrations for those students that I was doing for the elementary school students. Because when I thought about the Math 103 students, the fact is that, yeah, they're not going to become mathematicians. But they're going to go out and reproduce, generally with other people from the Math 103 crowd. And by the laws of probability, <laughs> some, of their, <laughs> some of their kids are going to be talented in mathematics. And, Seriously, one of the things that I worried about is I didn't want a kid who was talented in mathematics to go to his father and said, Dad, I need help with this math problem. And Dad said, I hated mathematics. Why don't you ask your mother? And goes to the mom and says, Mom, I need help with this problem. And mom says, I sucked at mathematics. <laughs> um, and so what happens is you have two parents who had uncomfortable experience with mathematics, dissuading children who have great potential in this subject. And I thought that was, you know, maybe we should be doing something about this. Maybe we're going about teaching Math 103 and liberal arts mathematics the wrong way. And I thought, well, if I could go back and do it again, I'd like the first day of Math 103 to be something that they could look back and say, you know, I really enjoyed that day. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my first day of Math 103. And as I said, some of the ideas come from demonstrations that I did with the third graders. And one of the things that the third graders do is they learn to count and they learn to spell. And so what I had was I have a demonstration that does both simultaneously. What I have here is I have cards with the numbers 1 through 10 on them. Um, in the back of the room, can anybody see what the number on this card is? Okay, great. So here we go. O, N, E, 1, <laughs> T, W, 
O two <laughs> T H R E E three <laughs> F O U R four. By now the kids are on their feet. <laughs> Wildly applauding. F I V E five S I X six. Notice the bar under it so it's not to be confused with nine. S E V E N seven E I G H T eight. I'm feeling pretty confident here. <laughs> N I N E nine. Note the bar under it, not to be confused with the six and ten. Now. There are 3,628,800 different ways that I could have arranged these cards, and only one of them comes up with things in this order. So, my first assignment to Math 103 is that I would give each one of those students individually a separate list, and I would ask them to arrange them so that it does the same thing. And the truth is that you can do this in an ad hoc fashion fairly reasonably. It's not going to take you all that long with 10. For instance, you can see that if there are 10 cards, the word one has three letters in it, so the fourth card is going to have to be one. Then TWO, uh, that'll be five, six, and seven. The eighth card will have to be two. You can sort of fill in and do it ad hoc. But suppose, for instance, you had a hundred cards to do, or a full deck of cards. I once did it with a full deck of cards. It took me, it took me about 30 minutes to arrange it. And one of the things that the arrangements of things is a branch of a subject called combinatorics. And combinatorics and the arrangements of things, those are our passwords on computers. And those are our passwords in the bank account. And one of the things that keeps our passwords safe is that there are so very, very many possible arrangements of things that it makes it very difficult for someone to hack into your password unless they get information. But one of the things that mathematics is also about, it's about doing things in the best possible way, in the most efficient possible way. And when students came and they did this particular assignment, they're going to go about doing it in, as I say, in an ad hoc fashion. It'll be trial and error, but they'll eventually get it because it, they don't have to go through all 3,628,800 arrangements before they find the right one. So, what I wanted to do is, after they've messed around with this a little and said, yeah, this is a solvable problem, but maybe I'm not doing it as well as possible, what I wanted to do is I wanted to show them the best way to do this. And in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a list that I've never seen before, and you're going to help me construct it. And let me introduce Raquel Santos from the, uh, from the Office of the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, who has agreed to help me. And so what I would like is we're going to have a list of 10, just like I have here. And what those 10 are going to be names that you people are going to suggest. They can be your significant other, your dog, um, the cubs. Um, and incidentally, I want you to know that I'm failing. Don't tell me what it is, but notice that cubs, C-U-B-S, plus L is C-S-U-L-B, if you, you, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you rearrange it. So anyway, what I would like is, and pl I would like uh, just people to uh, give me a name of maybe their favorite child or their favorite dog or uh, a sports team or something. Try to keep it to five or six letters maximum. And Raquel will write them down, and I'm going to write them down also, because it's going to be necessary for me to do that. But anyway, uh, can I have volunteers for names? Yes. Riley. OK. Can it be R-I-L-E-Y? Thank you. Um, yes? Kevin. Kevin. Uh, yes? Mike. Thank you. Um, shorter is better. <laughs> um, 
Okay, yes? Lee. Lee, even better. I, L E E or L I? Okay. Okay, we've got four. I need more. Joy. Oh, yes? K E N, wonderful. Um, B I Z Z Y. How many have we got? Yes? Barry. Barry. Um, and uh, how, uh, let's see now. Looks like I need, we, looks like we need uh, two more. Jim. Ah, great choice. <laughs> and yes. Cars. Uh, again? Cars. How do I spell that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to live in Southern California. Okay. Now, here's what you do in order to do this in the most efficient way possible. A lot of mathematical processes work in reverse to undo something. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the list by working backwards. The last one was car. On the next to last one was Jim, so I'll put Jim on top of it and reverse the process. J, I, M. Okay, next would be Barry. B, A, R, R, Y. Next is Busy. B, I, Z, Z, Y. Next is Ken, K, E, N. Next is Joy, J, O, Y. Next is Lee, L, E, E. Next is Mike, M I K E. I sure hope I don't screw this up. <laughs> Kevin, K E V I N. And last is Riley, R I L E Y. Now, what I did was I wrote these down. I need some independent witness to make sure that when I do this, um, I get it right. And Marianne, ne we've never met each other, have we? No, okay. 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 So R I L E Y. Um, next is Kevin K E. V, I, N. Ah, I know what I do. I'll share the wealth. Mike, M, I, K, E. Yep, Mike. Next is Lee, L, E, E. Um, uh, Joy, J. O, Y, um, Ken, K, E, N, Ken. Um, Busy, B, I, Z, Z, Y, um, Barry, B, a R R Y Barry. Uh, next is Jim J I M. That's me and Carr. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Now. The next demonstration that I would do, I first saw a variation of this performed at the Magic Castle by Art Benjamin, who teaches math at Harvey Mudd College. And 
Art is one of the good guys of the Western Hemisphere. And when he did this trick afterwards, I noticed there was a slight ambiguity in how he did it. And I said, you know, Art, this trick could, this trick could run afoul. And he said, yes, but I have ways to cover for that. <laughs> um, and so I thought of a variation of the trick that the interesting thing about the variation of the trick is it works 97% of the time. So I'm hoping that this works, that this is one of the 97%. And if it isn't, I'll tell you why it didn't work after I've done it. But this trick is called last digit standing. Art didn't call it that, I named it that. That's my contribution. Okay, now if you take a look at the number that's up here, 11022016, that's today. Okay, that's, you know, November 2nd, 2016. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a, a volunteer from the audience. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct another long number like this. And the person is going to, oh, I'm going to be blindfolded by Raquel during this entire process. <laughs> that, that's the fun part. Um, okay, and what the person is going to do is they're going to circle one of the digits between one and nine. Let's say they choose a two and circle a two. Not my best job of circling, but anyway, they're going to circle a two. And then what they're going to do is they're going to call off the remaining digits relatively slowly in any order they want. And as they call off the digit, it will be erased. For instance, let's say they said one, zero, six, two, one, zero, one. At which point, with my blindfold, if this is one of the 97% of the times that I get it, 97% that I get it right, I will, blindfold still on, say the last digit is two. And then I will explain to you how the trick works and why it only works 97% of the time. <laughs> that, <clears throat> okay, now, what we need to do is I need a volunteer and we've also got to come up with a long number because if we came up with 11022016, wouldn't be much fun because I know that number. And I know that number has three ones, two zeros, two twos, and a six, so I could probably work it out. Um, but can I have a volunteer who will help me with this? Okay, now if this were the third grade, they'd be all over me. <laughs> yes, sir, would you come up here? <clears throat> okay, now here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, my mother-in-law recently went to Las Vegas, and she knows that I like playing cards, and she stayed at the Wynn and got me this gorgeous deck of cards from the Wynn Hotel. And um, this is a paid advertisement, by the way. <laughs> okay, uh, and what I've done is I've, uh, I've eliminated the aces, tens, jack, queens, and kings, so this portion of the deck consists of only the, num the numbers two through nine. And what I'm going to ask this gentleman to do is to deal out, is to shuffle a deck, deal 10 cards at random, and show them one at a time to Raquel, who will write them on the board with a multiplication symbol. That's that X, by the way, for those of you who have been a while since you've had math. And so what we'll have is we'll have 10 one-digit numbers up there. And then Raquel will use her calculator to multiply them. And she will be checked on this because we got to have backup for this. And I got good backup, Professor Gao, chair of the math department, <laughs> so that we make sure that we've got the right product of the 10 one-digit numbers. And I'm with my blindfold. And then uh, what you will do is you will erase them one at, the one at a time and do it relatively slowly. And Raquel will just call out when you erase a four, she'll say four. And remember, choose one of the digits, one through nine, because it's really hard to circle zeros, trust me. <laughs> okay, so are you clear on what you wanted? Okay, uh, Raquel, would you, uh, this may look like a particularly ugly tie, and you would be right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, Tangan, could you get the uh, computer back again as well? Where is he? Okay, uh, okay. Uh, can you get the computer to go back again because it seems to be fading out? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, it's not. I'll uh, I'll do it. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, put the blindfold on me. Do I have? Yeah, I can't see, but uh, you know, this is one of those instances that somebody can poke something at me and, uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't react because I can't see, but trust me, and I'm not looking at the board anyway. Don't have eyes in the back of my head. Okay. Yep. Okay. Was it Richard who offered to assist me? I didn't, I didn't see the name on your card. Rob. 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 Okay. Deal, you know, shuffle a deck, deal out ten cards. Ten cards that I've never seen before. <laughs> okay, and if anybody else has a pocket calculator, which you'd have on your cell phone probably, and want to check that the multiplication is being done correctly, feel free. Okay, so you've got it multiplied out. Okay, and uh, uh, Tangan, do you agree? Yes. Uh, okay, start, uh, start eliminating the, di the digit. Have you circled one of the digits from one through nine? Circle one of the digits from one through nine. In the, in the, in the product, in the, in the product. Oh, in the product. Yeah, in the product. Okay, so st now the remaining digits, call them out in any order and erase them as you do, but not the circled one. Zero. Okay. Nine. Okay. Three. Okay. Two. Got it. Zero. Got it. One. Got it. Is that it? That's it. The remaining digit is a three. Okay, now I assume from the applause that I did it right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is a showstopper. <laughs> okay, here's the way this trick works. All the mathematicians are in sleep now because they knew, it, they knew how it works. But um, uh, it's, it's a really good example. The idea is there's something very important about the... Uh, about multiplying numbers by nine. If you have a number that is a multiple of nine, the sum of the digits will total a multiple of nine. Um, Tangan, if you had the uh, product, could you just write out the product again one more time? Nine, three, three, one, two, zero, zero. Nine, three, three, one, two, zero, zero. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, if you add up these digits, 9 and 3 are 12, 15, 16, 18, it's a multiple of 9. And as long as I start with something that is a multiple of 9, the sum of the digits will always be a multiple of 9. And so what all I was doing is, as, uh, as the numbers were being erased, I was keeping track of the sum in my head because it's not real hard to add one-digit numbers. <laughs> I, mean, I may be seven and 75, 7 and 5 are 12, 1 and 2 are 3, but I'm still pretty good at that. And so what happened is that when the last number, you know, when the last number, I'd, I'd kept the running total, and I'd had a running total of 15. 
Now, the next highest multiple of, of 9 after 15 is 18. So the missing digit has to be a 3. And this trick works 97% of the time. And here's the reason that it works 97% of the time. That's an exact, pretty exact figure, by the way. And it has to do with a branch of mathematics called probability. Because in order to get a number, notice that there are 10, I had, her, had 10 cards dealt from the deck of cards. In order to get a number that is a multiple of 9, I either, either one of these or more has to be a 9, or I have to have either, I have to have 2 from the collection of 3s and 6s because 6 has a, has, a, has a factor of 3 in it. So for instance, if I have a 3 and a 6, when you take that product, you'll get 18, which again, a multiple of 9. And so if you work out through probability theory, what you can do is you can figure out that the probability of choosing 10 cards from the deck consisting of the numbers 2 through 9 in such a way that there's either at least one 9 or if there isn't at least one nine, there are at least two of the set of threes and sixes. That's 97%. If, we, if it went two, four, seven, five, eight, three, two, four, five, seven, eight, no, the trick wouldn't work. But that only happens 3% of the time. So I'm glad that this was, uh, <laughs> I'm glad this was one of the good times. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you how probability, one of the ways that probability shows up in very unusual ways in your life. And I just had this happen the other day when I went to the dentist. Okay, now I don't know how you feel about dentists, but any time a dentist gets near me with a drill, I get nervous. <laughs> and one of the great inventions of, uh, you know, of Probably, I think the uh, anesthetics were originally discovered back in around the 1820, 1830, when they started experimenting with nitrous oxide. Novocaine is relatively recent, but I had Novocaine when I was young. And Novocaine is just tremendous. They give you an injection, and they can just hammer away, and you absolutely do not feel it. It's wonderful. And the reason that Novocaine works so well is a combination of geometry, also mathematics, and probability. The geometry that makes Novocaine work is the fact that signals are transmitted to the brain. This is always very surprising to me. You don't feel pain in the affected area. Your brain registers pain. And the reason that your brain registers pain is due to something called neurotransmitters. Biology professors here, of which we have several, can correct me if I'm wrong. But the geometry is such that um, when a nerve fires a signal, a neurotransmitter makes a connection, and it does so through geometry. It fits nicely into a particular pocket, establishes the connection, and, uh, more, and the message is transmitted. Sometimes it takes several, several relays to do this, but that's the way uh, that pain signals, or pleasure signals, I guess, are transmitted to the brain. And <clears throat> The way Novocaine works is the Novocaine molecules are shaped in such a way that they fit into the receptor pockets and block the neurotransmitters from making connection. So that even though when the dentist drills, your teeth are still saying, ouch, your brain isn't registering anything because the, because the signals haven't come through. But here's where probability comes in. And most of us, if you've had Novoc an injection of Novocaine, it's not that all of a sudden the Novocaine ceases to be effective and you feel everything. What happens is that sensation gradually returns to your jaw or wherever else that, you know, wherever else that was anesthetized. And the reason that that's the case is that all during the process of the dentist drilling, they're firing those neurotransmitter molecules. And every so often, one hits a Novocaine molecule absolutely perfectly and knocks it out of position and enables that particular, 
that particular receptor to be cleared to receive the signals. But instead of receiving however many million signals that are launched when the dentist starts drilling, you only start receiving a few at a time. And as those molecules keep firing at the blocking Novocaine molecules, they keep knocking them out of the pos position. That's due to the laws of probability because, the, you know, you fire all those things there. Some of them are going to hit perfectly. That's probability. And gradually over time, feeling, remain, you know, feeling returns to you with Novocaine. So that's one of the things that, you know, it, it's just amazing to me that how m the subjects of mathematics, which are very dry and abstract, um, when you first look at them on paper, just resonate throughout our entire experience. And the last trick that I want to show is a trick that I invented to show an eight-year-old kid. Uh, <laughs> and what a lot of, okay, good, this is, uh, I'm glad that this is still working. Um, so here's what this trick amounts, whoop, get up there. Okay. Um, what this trick amounts to is this trick is a trick where, uh, where I have to identify a card. And I want to get the deck of cards back. Um, where, were the, uh, where were the other ones? Okay. Now, what I'm going to ask for is another volunteer from the studio audience. The three year, I mean the third grade, <laughs> thank you very much. Ladera, come on up here. Okay, here's what you're going to do. Would you, uh, well, first of all, Raquel has to blindfold me. Um, but then what you're going to do is you're going to just select a card at, you know, select a card at random and give it to Raquel. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the denomination of the card. Um, by denomination, I mean whether it's an ace, king, queen, jack, ten, etc. I can't identify the suit because that would require more, uh, more information than I have. But here's what you're going to do, Ladera. You're going to pick a card. Let's say that you pick a seven, okay? Now, you'll notice that there are four uh, sets of cards here. There are four piles of cards right here. And what you're going to do is you're going to look through each one of the piles of cards. And if there's a seven in the pile, like there is in this one, you're going to select one card from that pile and you're going to give it to Raquel. And if there isn't a seven in the pile, for instance, there is no seven here, you're not going to take a card from that pile. So what you're going to do is you're going to take one card from each one of the piles, give it to Raquel. I'll still be blindfolded. After you've given, now you'll be given either one, two, or three cards to Raquel. And um, Raquel is then going to tell me what the cards that you have received, uh, that, she, that you have given to her, are. I'm still blindfolded. And what you're, if, for instance, if you chose a seven, Raquel will write a seven on the board so that everybody can see it. And then I'm going to identify the card. Um, well, let's see now. Um, okay, this is still tied. And a better job of tying it than I usually do, by the way. That, uh, I look at it this way. I'm already ahead of the game on that, the last digit standing one. So even if I screw this one up, <laughs> still good. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, OK, done? Yes. OK, what you're going to do is you're going to tell me the cards that Ladera handed you. OK. Uh, Whatever cards that Ladera handed you. She should have handed you either one, two, or three cards. Okay. So I just have one card. You have only one card? Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me what it is. Four. Four. Not so much applause. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been better if she had that. It would have been more impressive if she'd had two or three cards. But anyway, I'm going to tell you how this trick works also and what this trick has to do with. These are the piles that I show you. 
But these were not the piles that Ladera actually saw. Let me show you the pile. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click up, please stay on here. I'm going to click up a different. OK. Now, the piles of cards that Ladera saw were ace 3579 jack king of clubs, deuce 3 6 7 10 jack of diamonds, 4 5 6 7 queen king of hearts, and 8 9 10 jack queen king of spades. You'll notice that each pile consists of cards in a single suit. And what I, ha what I have done is I've arranged those piles according to the values of the numbers 1 through 13 in base 2. Now, um, base, <laughs> two, base 2 is the number system on which computers, on which computers rely. Because um, even though we count in a number system which has 10 digits, 0 through 9, um, they discovered very early on when they were making analog computers that it required an incredible amount of complicated machinery to distinguish between the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. But with zeros and ones, you only need on and off, or charge, no charge, magnetized thing, magnet, non magnetized thing. So that's why base 2 counting is the basis of what makes computers, uh, what, uh, what enables computers to um, um, be so efficient and so cheap. And the numbers in base 2 for, are very similar to the numbers in base 10. What happens is that in base 10, the, uh, the placeholders are 1s, which is 10 to the 0, 10s, which are 10 to the 1st, 100s, which are 10 squared, 1000s, which are 10 cubed, et cetera. And in base 2, instead of a 10, we use the, digit, we use the number 2. So the number, uh, we have units, 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s. And because the only digit are available are 0 and 1, every number can be expressed in terms of Zero, ones, twos, fours, eights, and sixteens, etc. For instance, let's take the number seven. The number seven is equal to four plus two plus one. So what it would be is here's the number seven here, one four, one two, and one one. And the way that these cards are arranged is such that clubs are those numbers which have a one in their base two expansion. For instance, the clubs are the ace, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, the 3, which is 0, 0, 1, 1. See, there's a 1 there. It's 2 plus 1. The 5, 4 plus 1. The 7, 4 plus 2, plus 1. The 9, 8 plus 1, etc. And so when there was one card that was handed to me, the Queen of Hearts, but I was, you know, I, uh, that will sometimes happen. Sometimes people choose a 4 or an 8 or a two or one, those would only require one card. But if, uh, if a seven had been chosen, a seven is a four plus two plus one. So the seven appears in the diamond pile, the heart pile, and the club pile. So I would have been handed a club, or at least Raquel would have been handed a club, a diamond, and a heart. And it wouldn't matter which club, diamond, or heart I was handed. I would, you know, maybe, I would, maybe uh, Raquel was given the three of clubs, the six of diamonds, and the queen of hearts. I'd say club, that's a one. Diamond, that's a two. Heart, that's a four. One plus two plus four is seven. The card that was selected was a seven. And this is part of the math 103. This is pa part of the math 103 um, syllabus that what we do is we teach them the importance of other number systems. And base two number system is what makes all our computers run and enables a lot of the electronic, um, the electronic uh, gadgetry that makes our world so much better than it was 50, 100 years ago. I'm a huge fan of math and science. I think all the other subjects are extremely important, but I think that civilization advances because 
mathematics and science enable better technology, better communication, better living. And I think that's what makes life more enjoyable and makes us a better and more productive species. Now, when I originally taught Math 103, the last time I taught Math 103 was probably about 1993, because I took a sabbatical, I went away, I became graduate advisor, and that substituted for some courses, and I was no longer teaching Math 103. But in 1993, I thought to myself, what I'd like to do is I'd like to work out a way to make liberal arts math, which, as I said, for most of the students who are taking the course, just check the boxes and get me out of here. Um, uh, make, give them an enjoyable experience learning about mathematics and maybe something they could hang on to. So I had an idea for a book. In the book, what I would do is I would tell a bunch of stories. Each story would center around a topic in a Math 103 curriculum. And maybe what would happen is the stories would be enjoyable and a few of the ideas would sink in. Because the truth is that when you're taking these checkoff courses, I took history checkoff courses. And I had at least three courses in which they taught me about the Battle of Agincourt and I couldn't tell you a thing about it. Just <laughs> left my mind as soon as I got beyond those courses. And that's what happens with the students in, in Math 103. But if there were just a couple of ideas that they will remember, and I remember a few things from my history courses because they were fascinating. I certainly don't remember all the things that my teachers wanted me to remember, but I re there were a few things that I could hang on to. And so what I did was I wrote this book. And a small publisher picked up the book, and I got an advance, and I started completing the book. And McGraw-Hill bought out the small publisher and said, we're not interested in doing that book. <laughs> so the book resided on my hard drive for approximately I don't know, close to 20 years, because I couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then when I retired a few years ago, um, I started doing podcasts on math and science books for something called the New Books Network. And one of the, bo one of the books that I read was an absolutely fabulous book called How Not to Be Wrong, written by Jordan Ellenberg, who's a professor of mathematics at uh, who's a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin. And Jordan Ellenberg starts How Not to Be Wrong with this anecdote. It's 1943. Enemy planes have been shooting down lightly armored fighters, and so the Army has decided to put extra armor on these planes. They can only put armor on one section of the plane, otherwise the plane will be too heavy. They've compiled the following data on how many bullet holes there are in each section of a plane returning from a mission. Here are the numbers. And this is the first anecdote in Jordan Ellenberg's book. And this, anecdote, this data came to the attention of a group called the Statistical Research Group that was located in New York during World War II. Everybody's heard of the Manhattan Project. Most people have heard of Alan Turing and the Enigma, uh, and the Enigma uh, machine in England. But the, uh, the the United States Army had commandeered a bunch of mathematicians to work on oddball problems that they felt might help the war effort. And these were really bright people in the room. Jordan Ellenberg says that to give you an idea of the caliber of people that were in the room, the fourth brightest person in the room was probably Milton Friedman, later, who would later go on and win a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and the brightest person in the room probably was Abraham Wald. Abraham Wald was one of the great statisticians of the 20th century. He was born in Austria and realized probably sometime in the 1930s that with a name like Abraham Wald, he wasn't going to be doing too well in Hitler's Germany. So he beat it over to the United States and the army gobbled him up for the statistical research group. And so everybody in the room is looking at these numbers and Abraham Wald says, you should put the, you should put the armor on the engine. And so everybody says, why? And Abraham Wald says, well, one of the things that you want to do in mathematics is that it clarifies things by looking at extreme examples. So imagine that instead of the number 1.11 that you see there, imagine that you saw the number zero. What would that mean? It would mean that every time a bullet hit the engine, the plane went down. That means that the engine is the most vulnerable section of the plane. 
and so you should put the armor on the engine. Do you need algebra, trigonometry, statistics, anything like that for? You just have to understand how numbers work. And getting back to the book that I wrote, when I read Jordan Ellenberg's book and I interviewed him, I noticed that Jordan Ellenberg had a sense of humor similar to my sense of humor, which I thought had been exhibited to some extent in the book that I wrote. And I said, Jordan, I'd like to send you a chapter from a book I wrote long ago, far away. Maybe you could contact your editor about it. And he read the chapter and he said, Jim, I know just the right editor for this. And <clears throat> What he did was he got me in touch with an editor from Princeton University Press, and earlier this year the book was published. And last year, um, the editor asked me if I could do a video trailer for the book. And I said, of course, not having the foggiest idea of what a video trailer was, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> so what I did was, when I find, found out, what I did was I called up the chair of the fine arts department in this, uh, in this school, and I said, here's my problem. I have to do a video trailer for a book. Can you help me with this? And he said, we have just the course that handles this type of thing. And so what they did was they came up with a video trailer and that's what I'm going to show you at the moment. As long as this thing works, please work at work before. Santa Monica was my first choice after moving from New York. It was beautiful, all right. But decent places there cost an arm and a leg. I started to look in Brentwood. I heard that rent there was a little cheaper. In New York, I tried to adjust to the fact that as big as the city was, I kept bumping into Lisa. I was a freelance investigator, and, well, she was an artist. It made for an interesting relationship, to say the least. We grew apart, and I tried to avoid her. But we crossed paths too often. I needed to get away. I answered an ad for a guest house. It was in Brentwood. A man answered the door. I said, my name's Fred Carmichael. I'm here about your ad. In a slight southern accent, he said, I'm Pete Lennox. We shook hands, and he invited me in. This guy was a sports junkie, probably a sports better. I wasn't wild about the main house, but I really liked the guest house. I mean, really liked the guest house. <laughs> we had a short negotiation about the rent. Pete looked at me, or rather he studied me. I'd seen eyes like that before mostly on Wall Street traders, or hustlers. I discovered that Pete had valuable skills that I didn't have. I was an experienced PI. Pete knew a lot about math. Soon, we became partners. As private investigators, we worked a lot of compelling cases together. We needed mathematical logic to help discover who was selling corporate secrets. We used conditional probability to turn the tables on this unscrupulous bookie. Statistics enabled us to figure out that a basketball game was being fixed. Our investigations took us to Hollywood, then Beverly Hills, then Orange County, Santa Barbara. In the end, I wrote it all down. I think you'll enjoy it. CSULB.
And what I would like to do is there were two people in the fine arts department who were, who played a major role in bringing this to fruition. And I'd like them to stand. One is Stu Rosen. Stu? Okay. <laughs> Stu was the faculty advisor for Fine Arts 360. And when this was played as a continuous trailer at the recent math meeting in Seattle earlier this year, um, everybody said, who's the voice? <laughs> the voice is Stu. And yes, yeah, he comes next. <laughs> and what Stu did was, when I started talking to Stu about this, uh, we, we had discussions about, uh, about this before it actually went into action. And Stu teaches FA 360, which teaches students who know a lot about cinematography and the nuts and bolts how to actually make uh, how the business of the entertainment business actually works. And he said, what we normally do is we normally divide up into about four groups and we have four projects, but I want to give you my best producer for this. And his best producer was John Tulp. John, would you stand? <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mm-hmm.